Hi, so if we're to dig down into the language of mathematics, the first thing I think we need to do is think about the need for mathematics. Where did it actually come from and what is it describing? Now, the earliest and simplest form of this language is the language of size. Now, in the language of size, we need two things. We need number and we need measurement. And they're very two different things. 50 sheep is 50 sheep is not really open to interpretation. If you have 50 and a half sheep, you don't have a half sheep. You have 50 sheep and a dead sheep. So number isn't as open to interpretation as is measurement. Because measurement very much depends on what it is you use to measure. And we'll come to that later. The history and development of mathematics is tied intimately to our history and development of a species. And of the mathematics of size, the language of size, the first thing we would have hit is number. It's more or less agreed that our very early ancestors led a nomadic lifestyle. But even in the nomadic lifestyle, you needed to have a sense of time. You needed to know where animals are going to be at a certain time. When you could eat oysters, when did the berries ripen? How old was somebody so they could become an initiate of the tribe? There was a degree of needing to know when things happened. Now, it's pretty much certain that the elders of the tribe would have recognised the lunar month. They would have known that it was 30 days long. They would have recognised the rising and falling of stars at dawn and sunset and that these would change through time. Now, if you're counting a flock or you're counting a herd, that's not really a problem. You can look at them and you can count them. The need to remember time is where number came from. If it's a long period of time, like a year or something like that, then it's difficult to remember. I can't remember what I had for breakfast three days ago, let alone uh, two months ago. So remembering how much had gone gave rise to the need of recorded numbers. Now, recorded numbers, when they first appeared, were little more than scratches on sticks or stones, and you can find them. They're called tally sticks. Once you start to record numbers, and you only need to record them as an aid to memory when they become large, you also need to group them. Because if you're just doing single marks, then you'll soon run out of sticks. What you need is a method of grouping them together. Because once you have the need to create groups, then you have two other needs that arise automatically from that. One is that you need signs to represent those groups of numbers, and the other is you need an agreement on what the group of numbers are. So it's pretty frequent, and we do it all the time, to count on your fingers. And of course, fingers became a method of understanding what the group meant. So there is um, certain areas where they use five as the group meaning. And of course, we use ten as the group meaning. Some tribes used hand and foot as the group meaning. So you could have two hands plus a foot. It didn't really matter as long as there was an agreement on what that grouping was. So you had a set of tally marks that you then represented by another sign, and that sign had to mean something, and it meant whatever group size you were using. And that group size we now understand as base. So we use base 10. So we have 10 in a group, and we have 10 in the next group, and so on, getting larger. Of course, once we get that going, we can abandon tally sticks, and we can use the abstraction of position. Instead of using sticks where we record these groups of numbers of a tally, you can use pebbles. You use pebbles in place, and that means you can count by placing pebbles at a particular spot. That quickly was overtaken by putting those pebbles onto sticks, drilling a hole through them and putting them onto sticks. And so the abacus was born. Now the abacus was independently created across the whole of the world. When the Spaniards arrived in Peru, they found the Peruvians using the abacus. Because the abacus was the only means of helping to calculate until about the Christian era, and it's still well used in China today. Of course, the creation of the abacus had a huge impact. It was actually in the, in the Hindus, in the Indus Valley, where they created the sign for the empty stick, the zero. Now we have an idea of position. If we have the first stick with nothing on it, then we have nothing. If we have the first stick with a pebble on it, in the second position, we have ten. Five, sticks, uh, five pebbles on that stick in second position means fifty. 
and so on. So five pebbles on the second stick, two pebbles on the first stick means 52. And so we could have a rational way of approaching counting where we no longer needed to remember. The abacus, of course, meant other things. It meant that you fixed the base in which you were counting. You needed a restricted set of uh, symbols to represent the numbers you were going to need. Ten symbols for every number you're ever going to need. And you could transfer it onto pepper. Now, somewhere around 5000 to 10,000 BCE, the nomadic life began to come to an end, and people were settling down in villages. And sort of around 3000 BCE, it was in the main areas of the Euphrates, the Tigris, the Nile, the Yangtze, the Huanggo, the Indus, where you saw all of these villages springing up and consolidating themselves into towns. And of course, that didn't happen in isolation or begin everything anew. The people who went into these towns and into these villages brought with them a number system, a way of counting, a way of understanding that. And that wasn't usually held in the general population because you wouldn't really need to know that on a day-by-day -day basis. It was usually the province of the shaman or the elder of the tribe. And that transitioned it from being the property of everybody to the property of a few people who would hand out that information. And it also began a whole new set of problems. But when we enter a village or town life, we already begin to have five classes of people. You have the craftsmen or artisans who can make the pottery and the metalwork and the stonework. You have the farmers who do all the planting and growing. You have the soldiers to protect them. Then you have the special priestly class who hold all of this knowledge. And then you have the rulers. Now, the priestly class and the rulers obviously don't do anything. They rule. They don't go and plant a field or anything like that. So in order for them to do their job, as it were, people would voluntarily, initially, give up a part of their produce to support those two classes. Of course, as the organisation continued, it became involuntary, and we know it now by the name of taxes. Now, taxes meant recording large numbers. It meant measuring how much you had produced so a tax could be taken. There was one other unfortunate consequence of where you lived. The Nile flooded every year. Because you know, when it flooded, it basically washed everything away. And what you needed to know was, where was your land and how big was it? Now, the problem with measurement is it's prone to error. It depends very much on the stick you use to measure it, or the stone you use to weigh it, or the cup you use to take the volume. It's very prone to error. And even now, after 10,000 years of development, we cannot agree on a universal system of measurement. One part of the world uses one system, another part of the world uses another system. We still can't agree on what that system of measurement should be, and we even now use different systems. So back then, a stone, which was a measurement of weight, would vary in size. So a stone in Egypt, which was literally a stone of a certain size, would be different from a stone in England, which was a stone of a smaller size. So you couldn't say, let's ship 10 stones of wheat and get one stone of tin, because it didn't mean anything, because there was no conjunction between those measurement systems, and the measurement systems themselves are prone to error. So we had two huge problems that had ar arisen. Of course, movement into town, development of class, and that actually led to the third problem of measure, and that is three dimension. Because you're going to build large buildings, large temples, large storehouses, town networks, that sort of stuff, you need to know where it's going to start and where it's going to end. Because you're not going to do it with one person who has this in his head like you used to do in the small village or putting up a tent. All of a sudden you've got hundreds of people working on something and if you start a wall that way and a wall that way, bend a corner, those two need to meet. And if you can't direct that activity and communicate that activity, you're not going to be able to build a building. The other thing is the building, the wall, needs to be straight up. How to measure area and how to measure volume. So our language of mathematics, based on size, which was in the nomadic culture pretty much a matter of number, now becomes a matter of number 
and measure. Of course, to measure area, you could use a square. We do that these days with graph paper. Lots of little squares on the area you want to measure will give you a measure of that area. The problem with squares is um, it's open to error. The error is as big as the square that you use to measure it. So if you're using a bit of land and you have a, a one yard by one yard square, you can be a couple of hundred squares out by the time you've worked out how big that area is. One way that's much more accurate and is actually easier to do is to use triangles. If you put a triangle down as a stretched rope between pegs, work out the area as the, um, sides, the two sides, then you can double that and you've got your area. So a triangle is easier to do and much more accurate. Hence the obsession in antiquity with triangles. Because for triangles, what you need to know is information about the angle. So angles and length as a representation of triangles became extremely important because then it led directly to how much land you had. Where was that land and how much tax could you give on that land? And equally, of course, there was an obsession with volume. A volume can be measured in one of three ways. You can use a box, you can use a cylinder, or you can use a cone. And all of those were used. But of course, what that means is there's an obsession with geometry. It's an obsession with the volume of things and the area of things. And it is steeped directly in people's experience of their everyday lives. Now I can tell you the volume of a cylinder, and it's pi r squared times height of the cylinder. But I can do that with retrospect. I can do that because this has already been done for me and I know the formula. Back then, actually, it was worked out by trial and error. It was, in fact, worked out to be roughly the decimal of 22 over 7. Now this isn't something just popped into existence. It was derived over hundreds of years of trial and error, going bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller to get a more and more accurate representation of this number that would help you calculate the volume of a cylinder for tax purposes. We now call it pi, but it was recognized as 22 over seven. Actually, there are other ways of looking at it too, bear in mind. None of this stuff was kept as formula. Just like the right angled triangle relationship 345 creates a, tri a right angled triangle, this wasn't kept as formulae, this was kept as rules of thumb. If you look at the priestly scripts, of which there are a couple remaining, one in the British Museum and one in the Museum of Moscow, they are in fact just scrolls of these rules of thumb that have been worked out over generations to give a good, relatively accurate, estimate of what the volume of these things were and how to work out a right angle triangle. Equally, of course, true to a priest class, this information was kept secret. It's one of the great secrets of the priestly temples. And it wasn't shown how it was derived. All that happened is the rule of thumb was given and you had to apply the rule of thumb basically on trust, and nobody bothered to explain how it had been arrived at. You were just told what it was and to trust it, and then you could use it. That sounds terribly familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> and it might well have stayed that way, apart from the arrival of the Greeks. And the Greeks had two things going for them, in a sense. One was they didn't really have a priestly class to encumber them. And the other was they were incredibly argumentative. I mean, they spent most of their history fighting against each other and the rest of it arguing against each other. And what they demanded, if they were going to agree with somebody, is that you give them proof. I mean, this is ringing bells with me like you wouldn't believe, so I hope it's ringing bells with you. But the Greeks wanted proof. Now, usually they put this down to a, a Greek chap called Thales. I think it was 640 to 5, uh, five something or other, 540 BC, something like that. But he demanded it be kept in secret. And of course, we're talking about the Greeks here. Thales was well traveled, but so was Pythagoras. Pythagoras went to Egypt and Iraq and further afield, they think. He came back to Greece, and of course, he was a teacher. And being a teacher, he wanted to disseminate all this knowledge. In order to do that, he had to supply proof. Now, by the time of Euclid, this had become enshrined. Proof was fundamental to what it was that you were trying to show because proof gave it validity within the Greek world where you needed validity or nobody would listen to you. So because of Greek economic and social situations where we now needed proof, we get the point at which mathematics becomes a bit more abstract. 
I can make a right angle triangle, triangle out of a triangle 3, 4, 5, and that will be a right angle triangle. That's not proof, that's just an example. Now it works, so 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, and together you get 25, which is 5 squared. So it works just fine, but it's a rule of thumb. In order for it to be true of all triangles, we have to remove the number. We have to remove the number and place it with a box in which any number can go. And that idea of a box in which we can place any number makes it abstract. Making it abstract makes it more difficult to get hold of it. A rule of thumb is easy because you can translate it into a real world example and you're away. An abstract means interpretation and of course that becomes much more difficult. So if we make A, B, C, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, is far more difficult than the 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 5 squared. We know that, we can work that out. But a squared, b squared, that's an abstraction and makes it more difficult for us actually to get hold of the fact that those letters are just placeholders where numbers can go and the right numbers will fulfill that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Only we'll do that if you put the right numbers in the boxes which A, B and C represent. Of course, 3, 4 and 5 are already numbers, and so we have no problem with it. But it creates another thing. It creates that idea of what constitutes a proof. Well, of course, the Greeks were well ahead of that, and what they came up with the system of what constitutes a proof. First, you had to cle clearly define the terms you were going to use. Second, you had to clearly define what it was you were relying on. That is, what things were taken to be fundamentally true, the postulates you were going to build your system on. And third, you had to clearly explain and justify the techniques you were going to use, the methods you were going to use in your investigation. Because that is fundamental to the scientific method that we use today. It's one of the core of how you perform an experiment. Now, that's great. Uh, apart from point two, what it is that we fundamentally agree to be true. Now, when Euclid set out his principles, of which there are about 200 or so, one of the things that he talked about was a flat plane, something being flat. If you had a flat plane, you drew a straight line, the true straight lines were uh, parallel lines, they would extend into infinity and never cross. And the only issue was discovered when people started sailing about. If you happen to be an Egyptian priest living in a temple for whole, your whole life in one position, then sure enough the stars would rise and fall in the same position all of the time, and when the sun cast a shadow, the shadow at noon would point in a certain direction. But when you started sailing far enough, what you found was you couldn't see the same stars. The stars wouldn't be in the same position of the sky. Sometimes when the sun shone at noon there was no shadow, sometimes it pointed one way and sometimes it pointed the other way. And what was understood by this was that the earth wasn't a flat plate, the earth was a sphere. And because it was a sphere, this is what happened. And we got that heliocentric view, the idea of the sun being at the centre and the earth being a sphere. That change in the truth that we took to be fundamentally true, of course, had a huge knock-on effect on the postulates and the ideas that had been proposed, because now a huge number of those were just built on sand. So to my mind, there are three takeaways here. The first one is there must be a fundamental truth that we can all agree on. Even if that changes over time, the idea of the truth being fundamental to the postulate so we can build the system is a basic building block. There has to be something that we can all agree upon in order to move forward. The second is there has to be some kind of argument that is logical and acceptable to people as being an argument that constitutes a proof. Something that we can say, yes, we can all agree with that, ergo we can move forward and that proves that. And the third thing is the um, perhaps most difficult thing that people have to deal with in mathematics, and that is the idea of abstraction. We don't need an actual number to be there. We can put a placeholder, like a letter or a box, that will hold different numbers. And that abstraction is one of the most difficult things to get hold of. But those three ideas are what I think that history up to the antiquity period has contributed to the development of mathematics. And it is rooted intimately in our development and our experience of the world and what needs we had in order to live, to grow together and to move forward. 
So mathematics didn't begin its life as a complete abstraction. It began its life rooted in our everyday experience and need. There was a need to develop an abstraction. That abstraction, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, is where we leave antiquity. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video series so far. Thank you very much for watching, and please remember to like and subscribe.